Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is presented by New York Mutual Trading. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. We're a member-supported food radio network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. Join our hosts as they lead you through the world of craft brewing, behind the scenes of the restaurant industry, inside the battle over school food, and beyond. Find us at heritageradionetwork.org. Hello and welcome to Snacky Tunes. I am one of your hosts, Darren Bresnitz. I hope everyone out there is staying safe and washing their hands. We know it is a very odd and sometimes confusing time, but please make sure to read the news, check your local medical listings, and just be smart about staying safe. Also, if you can, please support your local restaurants, businesses, anyone like that. They're struggling a lot right now, and some of them will not make it through this pandemic without the support of people like you, even if it's getting a coffee, ordering a taco, Maybe just stopping in to say hi, even getting some toast, something small. And if you can tip, you know, a lot of these people are going to need everyone to come together. And if you can, please help support your local business. We have a great episode with Min Fan from Porridge and Puffs. It's one of our favorite new restaurants, relatively new, that's in the hi-fi area of Los Angeles. We talk about serving the neighborhood, building a local community, and also the beauty of the solo diner. And then we dig deep into the archives for one of our favorite performances from Sin Kane, a Sudanese American multi instrumentalist multi genre, incredible musician. It's a great, great, great listen for uh, either when you're out running errands at the grocery store or you're hanging out at home. So please, 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 again, be safe, support the local community. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Snacky Tunes here on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. We talk about food. We talk about music. With musical dudes. Finger on the pulse. Snacky Tunes.
Hello and welcome to Snacky Tunes. I'm with Min Fan of Porridge and Puffs, and we are in Hi-Fi, historic yeah. Filipino town. Yeah. Which is great. I actually never heard it referred to as Hi-Fi until I heard you refer to it as Hi-Fi, and I love it. Hi-Fi. Hi-Fi. Yeah. Uh, we are sitting in a very beautiful space, a very neighborhood space, and we have felt for a long time that for restaurants to really succeed and, and have longevity, that they need to become neighborhood restaurants. Um, is that how you would describe Porridge and Puffs? I think that's our intention. I think it takes, um, the road takes a few tangents, and I think the first, we were, we're in our first year, year mm-hmm. and a, you know, we're a little past the first year, and I think the first year, it's a mix between a neighborhood joint, not immediate neighborhood, some immediate neighbors, but the neighbors meaning Echo Park, Silver Lake, um, Los Feliz. East uh, side. East side, yeah. We're, do you know we share the same zip code, um, 90026, as Echo Park and Silver Lake? We just prefer not to call it that. We wanted to stand out a little bit. Um, but that's our clientele. You know, our clientele is within this area, West Lake, sure. um, K-Town. Um, all yeah, East Side. I mean, it's East Side's very broad. But and then we also get a good amount of destination diners on the weekends and at night. Yes. Um, and that's because of press, thankfully, and people who've known us and live from far away. So it's a mix. That okay. press, though, especially with the way there's so much turnover now, it comes for the first year, a couple of years, but then you really got to settle in and yeah. really become a place that people who live in the expanded neighborhood to go. I'm craving this, we're coming here, this is part of our eating routine. Totally, and I think we struggle with that a little bit. Um, I think people always say year one's really hard. Knock on wood, for us, year one wasn't as hard. You as can it. knock on the table for that one. There we go. Yeah, and it's literally wood. Yeah. Um, year one was, I planned year one out, and I had very high expectations of myself personally, but very low expectations. Work in the restaurant industry, sure. knowing what is realistic, but had very low expectations of what, you know, what financially we needed to deliver and what milestones we needed to meet. I, those were very low, and I kind of set up the restaurant so we can have, so we can meet those expectations, and we did. Um, so year one was easy. Year two, I knew year two, going into year two now, I know it's much harder because you have to, how do you stay relevant? You can't, you know, you can't be like, I'm going to invent, we do. I mean, I kind of do. I'm like, I'm going to invent this every week. And you do. And you have that fresh new bowl, you have that fresh new dish, and that keeps people coming back in. And a fresh new service all the time. So we really, I mean, at my core, I like creating things and making things new. You know, I like innovating things. So that's at my core, but it's not a great way to run a food business people love consistency 100%. they love the same thing they'll say they want innovation but you look at what people buy and what it's 99 percent of the time it's the same three things so yeah. i mean it kind of bums me out because we'll like test things and put it on the menu and then people don't really so it takes a while but yeah the being a neighborhood place is really important to me i mean i love that and uh you being in the restaurant business for so long you've sort of seen the ups and downs of it. I mean, you had Field yeah. Trip, yeah. which closed. Yeah. And what was your mindset then, I guess? Let's go back a little bit, because I want to yeah. I want work our way back now and, and work our way to the restaurant. Like, So you're at Field Trip, you had a restaurant that was doing a little bit, if not more consistent, but like it was a more traditional yeah, type of restaurant. When you, when you think of like, a, oh, someone has a restaurant, they're a chef, I have an idea of what I'm going into. Yeah. And that closed. So did that, having gone through that and going through the experience of doing something by a certain set of rules, then allow you to free you up to be like, what's next? How do I want to approach the next project? I think I've always been out of the box, even when the reason Field Trip was in the parameters it was, Mm -hmm. it was a partnership with the Hollywood Farmers Market and and CLA. And they, I had to run the menu and the concept by them. And when I brought up Porridge and Puffs, 
to the board. They just kind of like, it was a different language. Mm. And I was going like, you know, more forged goods and stuff that from the, from, cause we were, you know, we had, we had to buy everything from the farmer's market. So I'm like, I was telling the farmers to bring me things that they were getting that no one was buying. Sure. And, and you know, and, and I, and that was the concept. It's like, this is this porridge thing and I'm using, you know, rice from Coda Farms, which is at the market. And I'm going to test out grains from Tehachapi and all these grains that can become porridge. And that was the original concept. And no one, not one of them bought on into it. It was really hard. So they're like, why can't you just do a farm to table place? And I'm like, I've been doing farm to table places my whole fucking career. You're yes. like, I can. Yeah. So yeah. can so the next person. So I did. Yeah. So I did. But then I snuck in a lot of things. And, you know, like I worked at Beachwood. Yeah. And again, you know, it's up in the hills and it's like far, very farm to table. And then I snuck in, you know, I snuck in porch there like, you know, yeah. 15 years ago. So when Field Trip closed and you, I mean, it seems like didn't get to execute the full vision you want because other people didn't get it. Um, how did that leave you feeling? You know, the funny thing is I didn't think Porridge and Pest was, it wasn't supposed to be a long-term project. Got it, it was supposed to be a very, it was supposed to be an exploration of grains and how they play into a liquid and a solid. Mm. Liquid, you know, meaning porridge and puffs is also a grain, you mm-hmm. know, rice grain. And I was like, and I was going to play with all the grains. I'm like, every single culture does things with grains, but I really wanted to bring grains back and look at grains and see what they do, you know, in different forms. So that was the project. Um, and it was at field trip and I didn't really, I kind of called it porridge and puffs because you know, when you name a file, when you first name a file, you don't give it an abstract cool name. You name it exactly what it is. People should know by now that when you name something that there is a good chance that name is going to stick. Which is really scary, right? Yeah. Cause it's like the, it's the, it's the name I gave a file on my computer cause it's <laughs> supposed to be so straightforward, right? And so, I don't want to search for this. I don't want to think like Lucid yeah, Dream 36. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So I just wrote it down. I'm very, you know, and I'm, I'm the least literal person, you know, you can sure. find. Because you tell me something and I'll think of it very abstractly. I'm yeah. Like, bit, bit, bit. And I like, I hate being really literal because I'm like, where's the gray area? Where's the nuance? And that's so being very literal is not my thing. I do like alliteration with porn shows. But when Jonathan Gold comes in and he's like, what's this porridge and puffs and I you know then he writes about it and then people come in and you're like oh shit this name oh he put that he made that real yeah and it became very tangible and then you know and I'm not a dummy so I'm like shit you know what I think there's legs on this and people want this and I think I've always liked porridge and I wanted some component of it because I just think it's a very for me it started off as not only as culinary and scientific and learning about these grains and using ancient grains and using farmers but it's also a great way to look into the future and how do we use waste you know Mm. like and how do we look at grains into the future and that was to me and how do we look at traditional things and bring it into the future so that was always really important to me but I do that with everything not just grains and porridge but the name porridge and puff stuck um it's easy to hang your hat on like you have an idea of at least what you're going into yeah. because it's so much it's really a, a canvas for you, it, all of it, your work i'm glad you're saying that because i think it's i think a lot of times i'm like god this name is really holding me back and i always look at the name like port and puff but the and is the plus sign and yeah. that's important to me the yeah. plus is the most important thing in the name <laughs> that plus is the drop yeah. down menu yes and there's a million things under there But, you know, so many people have those base staples in a culture, rice, noodles. It's usually a carbohydrate or a grain of some type. And that is just the the bulk of it. And then what you do with it, what you put on top of it, is where the artistic flourish, the free association comes. And especially being in a place like L.A., you have so much opportunity to explore what goes on top. Right, or what goes inside it. What, what goes inside, inside it? it. Like, how do you cook it? How do you study grains? How do you make it? How do you blossom it? How do you bloom it? How do you... It reacts different on a different day. And for me, that I'm, I nerd out on that stuff. You know, I smell it. And I'm like, something's off. You know, it could be the same rice, but, you know, maybe we stored it differently. We stored it in a different place. Did we wrap this? Did we... You know, I'm constantly... And that's, like, for me, really fun. And that's something that I think is... I hope is inspiring my staff. I'm like, this is the... I think that kind of care and thoughtfulness is not being passed on as much. 
because I, I think that's what I'm trying to create with my team. It's like, hey, you know, let's put the thoughtfulness back. Let's ask why every time, you know, rather than just doing. I think a lot of times the kitchens just do it because I'm the chef and you say that. And that's what I grew up with a lot. And I'm like, this is so dumb. Like, why? And you know, I want people to be able to have common sense, to, ha to have a sense of where things come from and sense why. Sense of purpose. Yeah. So in between Field Trip and the brick and mortar, you did a lot of consulting, you did a lot of pop-ups, um, you saw a, more of the world both physically being out of a restaurant, mm -hmm. but then also the literal world itself. Yeah. What lessons and what learnings did you take going into the new project? Was there anything that you saw during those couple of years that you still use the reference point today? I think... I come from fine dining, started there early on, which I think a lot of chefs do when they change careers, especially if they're educated and they, you know, they did something else and they come back and they're like, shit, you know what, I don't have the time in my favor, I'm not 16, I can't lug a, shit, a lot of shit and work really fast and prove myself in sure. that way. So you better be really smart. If it's mm -hmm. your second career, you better learn really fast, work three times as hard, and I'm a woman, so you, you know, there, there's all these things that make you work harder and faster. Mm -hmm. um, and I think being out of it, I think confidence was always an issue. That's why I went to culinary school, because I'm like, confidence was always, I, I really want, um, I really want some competency, and I want to know the language, I want to be able to communicate it. So I think that helped build confidence. I don't think it's necessary. I think the confidence is in there, but. But, but how you get that confidence is everyone's own personal journey. Totally. Because you see some people who are confident, and I go, I don't know how you got that based on the work you've done, yeah. but you got it in spades. Yeah. And then for me, it's like it's knowing information and mm -hmm. then forgetting all of it. Hmm. I'm a big believer in breaking the rules. Great. However, you better fucking know the rules so you don't reinvent the wheel. And I think that's like my problem with people a lot. I'm like, oh, you think you're out of the box, but you're actually inside the fucking box because you don't know where the box is. Oh, uh, that's worse to be like, you're in the box, you don't even know you're in yeah. the box. And so for me, it's really important to know, to be as educated as possible, and then to kind of have it way in the back of my mind as a foundation and then kind of forget about it and be like, yeah, but okay, I get it now. And I, I like to see things anthropologically and you know, it's just like, I like to see it from different views, but I don't think you can without having some experience. So I think that time, it's age, it's experience, it's returning to a place that I thought I needed to know and understand, like fine dining. And then I just realized I fucking hate I love fine dining in the sense that, yeah, you know, it's kind yes. of fun, but I kind of hate it ethically because there's so much waste. Yeah. There's the diners, there's a class difference. There's a different sense of purpose. And in general, no matter where you are, spaces, places that claim sustainability and it's gotten a war, they're fucking wasteful. Yeah. I know they're waste. I've been in those places. I'm not going to call them out. And they're like, green award, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you're blowing your nose with the fucking napkin that you throw out one time. Right. That's like fucked up. Like right. you know, and that napkin is a fucking Danish napkin that costs you four bucks. That you had to fly over. Yeah. yeah. And, and the jet and, fuel and, and, and everything. You know, and like, you guys, come on. You know, like it's just so. I think it helped me really get comfortable with what I do. And I said, you know what? Let's take all the good things. Let's take the innovation. Let's take, you know, let's take staff education sure let's take these things that are really awesome take out the toxic masculinity that I think is really bad in the kitchen culture of course um, take out the sense camaraderie should look different to me because you know it's like I think I've always been I was older I don't think it's because I'm female because I've always been a tomboy and I've always been one of the guys yeah but I've always been a little bit older than most of the kitchen staff and I'm like god you guys are immature like this is such a waste of your time and a waste of my energy so I wanted to change that you know what I mean and I'm like how do you have camaraderie without having a pissing contest you know it's like, tough yeah it's, so, it's tough when you're trying to prove yourself as well when it's competition yeah, when you yeah, see it as yeah. a competition and you're all actually working towards the same goal. Yeah, true. But, but it's very tough to pull back and be like, we're all in this together. This is not about my individual career. Yeah. And because you, yeah, because you do, you know, I think it's, and I, and I think that inner confidence is so important. And that's also where it comes from as well. You're in there, 
maybe you don't feel as confident, so you think you got to either sabotage or shit talk yes. or or bully someone to make it seem like you feel more that's comfortable. That's a very masculine thing. Sure. You know, I think women approach it very different. And cultural. Cultural as well. And, you know, and I think it's very different. And so I, you know, I did a lot of observation. I went to where I thought would be the best practices in work, um, in work-life balance, mm. because you hear about it, um, Scandinavia. It's amazing. But no, they, they have the same fucked up, you know what, they work 12, 16 hours a day too. But don't they have a better work-life balance when you have a kid and when you have different life happenings, or does that not apply to restaurants? It doesn't apply to restaurants. Huh. And what people don't realize. I did and not then, realize. And then the only way you can do it is if you're fucking Rene Rizepi and you take three months off to take your kids around the world. And he says he wants that for the rest of the world. I'm like, he, he'll probably do it, which is great, but it's a different fucking system. It's a different system. Where restaurants and small businesses are treated as culture. Yeah. It's, they're given grants. They're not asked to make money because it's, they're being given money to make this survive. And they survive on free labor from trust fund kids. Put all that together, you can't run a an immigrant business in LA. Mm -mm. And that model would never, no matter who I want to be, would never work for me. Awesome. Well, listen, we're going to take a quick break because I want to talk about that. I want to talk about how you funded the restaurant and the different types of restaurants that yeah. are opening in LA right now. We have a song from the archives here on Snacky Tunes on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. <laughs> Spilling words on your thoughts, leaving stains keep, on your mental. Let the light shine throughout your lifetime. Dig deep inside, keep my timeline. You know I see the show. Right, wrong, pray, keep keeping keep on. Let the light shine throughout your lifetime. Dig deep inside, keep my timeline.
Hello and welcome back to Snacky Tunes. I am one half your host, Aaron Bresnitz. We are at Porridge and Puffs, emphasis on the and, uh, right? Yes. Uh, we were with Min and we are sitting here in LA. Um, and I, if you've been following restaurant openings in LA over the last couple of years, I really feel there's only two sort of restaurants that are really opening. One is the smaller, sort of artistic, DIY-driven restaurant. And then the other end are these grandiose projects. And I feel that there's very little room in between right now for a different type of restaurant. Why do you think that's happening? And do you think that there can be a cohesive LA dining scene with such extremes when it comes to restaurant opening? I don't know. I, I really don't know what the formula is. I just know that if you want to open a restaurant like the way I did, you better work really fucking hard. Like you're working like sometimes like 22 hours a day the first year. Yeah. Like two hours of sleep, you put the short ribs in, you go home, you shower, you come back you're back on the line. It's like, it, it literally. And you know, and it's just, I don't know if people really want to do that. And if I want people to do that, because that's not really healthy, but I don't know if there's any other way to do it. And if you're a small place, I have to wear a lot of hats because everything is so expensive. Mm-hmm. I don't have, I am my own lot. Our team, I'm probably going to get in trouble for this one day, but our team is literally four people in the back. Wow. All shifts. And, you know, we're trying to figure, because, and that's one thing that I did learn from fine dining and, you know, being Copenhagen is they have one team that works 12 hours, that works from the beginning, preps, do their own stuff, and works all the way through. And I think it makes for really great talent, Mm -hmm. and it really consistent, and we've taken that. But the labor market doesn't really let you do that, because there's not enough people who want to do that. No, because people do that for six months, and they're like, I want to go over to my own spot. Totally. And it's a very high level of talent. Mm -hmm. And you are dealing with people who, yes, who probably have the potential to open their own place, but with whatever situation, they're not quite, you know, they're not doing that. But that's where I'm looking at the model very differently. For me, it's a bigger picture than just this place um, in the sense of the model. I really want, I think in the next year, I really want to look at the model and it's not, it's by far not, it's not perfect. It's very hard. It's, you know, it's a, it's a lot of centered. I have to work a lot. I have to make ends meet. I'm paying one tax and then deferring another and then repaying that. And, defer, and you know, it's a lot of numbers changing. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of work. And you're always on the precipices of, of you know, shit, did I pay this right? Did, you know, so it's a, you're wearing a lot of hats. Yeah. Um, so I don't recommend it for someone I don't know how people do it. You either do it because you don't have enough experience and you're just, you fuck up and it doesn't matter because you're young enough to redo it. (laughs) Right. Or you have to have a lot of experience like me where I'm like, you know what? Here are my thresholds. I know what I can invest. I know with my partner who also has a very demanding job and a daughter who, you know, like I know where my family life stands and... So I'm really lucky. Like, I know where everything stands. I'm like, okay, this is happening. We're going to this as a family. These are the sacrifices we have to make. Um, and for me, the payoff, hopefully, is figuring out this model to do it for others. And mm-hmm. to, you know, to have a collective, to kind of look at things differently than the way it's been done. Because our food system's broken. And I deal with a broken food system, restaurant system, all day, every day. And it breaks my heart. I mean, you could have... You had money. You could have had investors. You could have had people. Nah, I could have, but it sucks. Right, but what I'm saying is that it wasn't like, you know, from the time with field trip, from your, yeah. from your uh, pop-ups, yeah. from, you know, who you were in the LA food team, you could have put together someone else's money. Oh, so many offers came. But why didn't you? Because they suck. But why did they suck? Okay, what people don't realize is these deals... I'm going to just say it right now. Say it. These deals are meant for investors, and they're meant for chefs to fail. They're meant, these deals a lot of times, I mean, you know, there's, there's exceptions. What is I, it? People I, shorting the market? I think, there, I think there's exceptions. I think like a, I think some places that I know from afar that seems really good is because they're people I love. Is I'm like, I think Rustic Canyon family mm-hmm. is a good example. I think 
you know, Joseph Centeno has its own thing, but he's still head of that. Yep. Right? And I think, but I think Rustic Canyon family does a really good job. They're kind of, I think, when I look, I'm like that, they're kind of a, you know, like a tent pole. Of so you mean of people who are investing in other people's yes. restaurants and yes. saying, we're going to set you up yes. for success. Yes. But they're, that's ingrown restaurant people. Are yeah. you talking about investors who are coming to you that were just, you could have been a shoe shop, you could have been a magazine, you could have been dental supplies. Like, they were just looking to invest their money yeah, somewhere. Yeah, I don't, you know, I think I... I just don't think like that. I think ethically it feels really wrong. Yeah, there's two ways. There's a few ways you can do it, right? You can yeah. get restaurant people who know. I mean, you know, like there's a lot there's of restaurant There's groups. a lot of restaurant Ton. groups. And you talk to them and they're like, wait, you're taking a percentage right off the bat. I've done these numbers. I know these numbers. And you're going to nickel and dime my labor. My labor's super high. Like super high. Like I think people don't talk about this. Talk but, about it. But the labor percentage of labor, it's like. The first year, it's like 110%. It's like I don't even make enough money to cover my staff. It's like very, very hard. Thank God, you know, I have money saved away or I do catering gigs. Sure. I, I side hustle myself to pay my employees, if that makes sense. Like I will go, I'll go and do a, you know, a catering gig, you know, on my day off just so I can, you know. Right, and that money gets folded yeah, back into, into the, the restaurant. restaurant. Yeah. But I mean, that's. And that's. That's important. But also, and also. The other thing that people talk about is, um, well, you talked about a little bit at the beginning about outsider people who aren't in the restaurant and their influence on it. And that's everything from the food you're making and then also the design of the space. Like the, the space that you made, you came in, it's a fresh coat of paint, you put up a gorgeous, you know, dried, dried uh, you know, herbs and flowers, things like that. But you hear these like crazy five million, six million, seven dollar build out stories and you go, how do you make your money back off of that? You don't, because I ran the numbers. But <laughs> I, I run numbers a lot, which is like really funny because people don't think I'm a numbers person. I'm just really practical and ethical. Yeah, but you have to be when you open a restaurant. Yeah, you have I'm to be when you open yeah, any business. Yeah, you have to be a numbers yeah, it's person. Because it's a fucking business. It's a business. I wish I was an artist, and, and like you know, and like you know, the government of Denmark or Trump was like you know giving me money, be like you're an artist, cool. Here's some money, you know, give culture. I wish. Wouldn't that would be a great thing? It's like I'm an artist. I just have my art project is a restaurant. Yeah. That's what I want. Ooh, I mean, a little Pell Grant, a little oh Pell God. Grant for the restaurant. I'll tell you what. I'm, okay. I'm not going to tell you who I'm going to vote for because I don't know yet. Okay. But universal fucking health care. Yeah. It's going to fucking change it for me because it is going to take so much stress off of me. Yeah. Of how much I worry about my team and if of something course. happens and and if the workers' comp can go down because universal health care is included in that, it's a fucking game changer. Like I'm like that's going to help small businesses so fucking much. Yeah. I, I mean, I can talk about politics all day, but people don't fucking care about small businesses, and they're kind of the livelihood to make this culture really bright and abundant, because... They small- definitely do talk about middle-class small business as the lifeblood, yeah. unique selling point of America, like what makes America great, and, you know, that's right. essentially the, the American capitalistic dream where it's you can start a restaurant like this, you can change the system, and then you can become rich. But what about the cultural contribution? LA would not be the city it is if not for the cultural contribution, food scene, sure. of all the people that have restaurants and where they and immigrants. I mean you drive down Beverly. Yeah. You drive down Beverly and it's like you're you're going through the world. Of yeah. just the different small, exactly. nondescript, even just Latin American. Just fine, just t- fine. Forget yeah. the world, Latin. Yeah. You just go down, and it's like Guatemalan, Salvadorian, Chilean. Yeah. You just you just go, yeah. and you're like, these people aren't out there hustling for press. They're not in the cycle. They're just out there, just making food, yeah, and making a business and supporting their family and the community, and contributing these things that you otherwise wouldn't be able to eat. Building neighborhoods. Yeah. So. And that's important to me. That is important. And, you know, you coming into Hi-Fi as this restaurant, like, how have you worked to, going back to the beginning, make yourself a neighborhood business? Like, how have you worked to integrate yourself in? Because I know that you talked about in the past, like, you looked at other neighborhoods, but you didn't feel that those were the right neighborhoods for you. Like, why did you land here? How have you integrated yourself? And as you've talked about thinking about the future, what more do you see giving yourself back to the community? Um... I think we've changed the way, we keep changing. It's an evolution of, of the way we look at our space. I really wanted to come in, and I think it was really shallow of me. You know, it's like such a sophomoric move. Where I'm like, I want this to be a space for everyone. Sure. It's just like so idealistic and so wonderful. But 
the immediate neighborhood kind of didn't like us. Really? And that really bummed me out because I was like, I want to be a restaurant for everyone. I want. Sorry, I didn't mean to bang that. No, it's passion. You can yeah, bang on the passion points. I, I wanted it to be a restaurant for everyone. I wanted the, you know, like the, you know, the the general shop across the street, the Botanica, the discount mall. I wanted those people to come and eat here. I was so mistaken. They'd come in here and they'd be like, I want the combo plate with fried rice, and I just like, and uh, and I love Chinese food, and I'm like. And I just felt this sense of racism, you know, against mm. me. And, and then I'm like, and I'm like looking to find myself, you know, I find myself rethinking everything. And I'm like, I do want those people. But at the end of the day, I can't convince people right away of what we're doing. Sure. And sometimes that's hard, you know, because you want to win everyone's hearts. But what I of realize course. is, you know what, we do have, the people who come here have to know a little bit about something about us. Like what we do, mm. they come in and they, you know, they can come off the street, but they have to have a certain, you know, if you're expecting a combo plate with rice and chow mein and say, I love Chinese food, you're going to be so sad. And I think that made me sad. I'm like, oh, maybe that. And they're like, well, what are you? And I'm like, I'm Vietnamese. They're like, oh, well, you should make pho. And I'm like, no, 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 that's my mom. Yeah. You know, and then I'm like, and they're like, but well, this is Vietnamese food. I'm like, no, it's not Vietnamese food because my mom gets really bummed out when I tell people it's v- Vietnamese food. I can say I'm Vietnamese and I live in LA and this is an influence of, mostly it's an influence of the ingredients available to me. And the zeitgeist that's in you know the ether because we all get so inspired by everything we travel the world and we eat here and that's what this place is and it only can exist in its current form in LA mm-hmm. and I'm really proud of that but there's still such an education mm. of to the neighborhood that's changing the, but the thing is this neighborhood's always been like this K-Town's right there Silver Lake's right there. Echo Park's right there. So it's not like I'm coming in and being like, I'm going to make this neighborhood better. This neighborhood's fucking awesome. It's awesome. And, and I think people, like, they're like, oh, you're gentrifying. And I'm like, dude, this area's been here forever. Vietnamese people have been here forever. These are small businesses that look, are starting to look a little different with a coat of paint. You know, so I think those are things I struggle with because it's still, even though you know in your heart of heart you're doing the right thing, you still have to look at those other perspectives to see if, you know, to get a gauge on it. So I think what I've made peace with it with is it's going to be what it's going to be. And I have to wake up every day and say, am I being ethical? Am I doing the right thing? Am I how? Yes, I'm changing the neighborhood. You know what? That's okay. That's okay. And, but I think, and you know, and I think it's really, yeah, is it okay? And are you hurt? Who are you hurting? And what are you hurting? Are you pricing people out? And I'm like, wait, I've lived in this neighborhood for a long time. Alyssa Walker lives in the neighborhood. Like, these are people who eat here, live in the neighborhood. Yeah. It's a very diverse neighborhood. And what people don't realize is Echo Park here, it's a very diverse neighborhood. There's different ethnicities. There's different education levels. There's different income levels. And that's that's really exciting and interesting to me. Um, but people like to really just generalize, 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 and you can't. You can't. You can only go and talk about what you do through your actions yeah. and how you present yourself. And there's no clean answer. I mean, there's no easy answer. No, and and, I, and there's and you can't do a purity test. I think that's like the state I'm in in general. Is I'm I'm an immigrant, right? Like I can't. If you do a purity test on everything, you're gonna. You're, you're going to be so, and I'm old, and you're going to be so sad, you know, compared to the rest you're of, not like the, old. I'm not old, but compared to the rest of the restaurant world, when you're like 16 year old and, you know, apprenticing, I'm like, you know, you're like, yeah, you know yeah. what, I'm going to vote for, you know, I'm going to vote for someone who like, passed this purity test in every single mark, and I'm like, I'm like, I want to make sure it's this nuance, comma, please, like, it's just like, I think the gray area and the nuance is really important. And um, that's where the magic sort of happens. It's the best place. Right? Like, yeah. where, you're trying something new, it's not perfect, not everyone's happy, but it's a little dangerous, but it's also a little And I safe. love that space. But that space is like where the art comes from because if yeah. you came in here and you said, I know what the neighborhood needs. It needs fuck, I don't know. But, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. If that's your approach, then of course when people come in like, fuck you, you don't know what we need. But you're going, look, this is what I can afford. I'm funding this out of pocket. I don't have investors. I'm making new food that I believe in. Uh, I live seven minutes door to door. I grew up here. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know this place. It's like, where, it's like, where yeah. do you want me to go? This is my neighborhood yeah. too. Yeah. 
And I, I, I don't know, it's tough, but you, you know, look, when you, when you open the doors to the public, you open the doors to the public. Yeah. And you can't pick who gets to walk through with their impressions and their attitudes and things like that. No, and you have to just be open all the time. All and that's time. something that we train our staff. So one other part of the community that I love that has found a place here is the solo diner, which in some cases has a stigma against, um, but there really is a beauty of going out, bringing a book, or just coming out and eating a meal by yourself. There's, there shouldn't be a stigma, right? Because it's like, I think uh, I love going to the movies alone. Sure. I love you. I just like being alone a lot. I, I, and, and I think yeah. you should be comfortable in your, and I, yeah, I, I think the age of having to be coupled or having to be with people I don't get that. I don't, I, I really, I Sometimes mean, I do. Sometimes you are just surrounded by other influences of people, social media or work or things like that, that you go like, I just want to have a meal by myself. Yeah, I love having a meal. And I think it's part of what we, I love inner confidence and just being comfortable in your skin. It's something I work a lot with my team. So we have to, but being able to be comfortable in your skin takes out of forces mm. to remind you to be comfortable in your skin by yourself. It's that confidence. And that's really important with our team. We, we train them meticulously to make people feel really comfortable about themselves because that's what I love. And I think, you know, like, yeah, I go to places and it's not that I don't love music because I love music, but does it have to take over my life when I go into a place? You mean like a restaurant like or a, a restaurant, store? Like yeah. a restaurant or a store. And sometimes it's so offensively loud or also not programmed well to the point where it's like this is obviously just an afterthought and it's actually disrupting the experience it just it can it can be quiet have some light jazz yeah throw some mild davis on that's what we do you obviously know us very well yeah we're either we 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 pretty much oscillate between some sort of a night because i'm stuck some sort of like early 90s post new wave Love it. Indie pop, you know, anything from Bell and, like Bell and Sebastian mm-hmm. and the Shins to Miles Davis. And that's kind of like, that's how we all, and then Edith Piaf at night because I love Edith. And that's of about, course. you know, so that's kind of what we play. But I I'll take Breeze from that oscillation, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I like it. It's just, uh, I think it gives you room to think and contemplate. Our food, I think, I make the food for you to be contemplative. You don't have to be. You can be nourished in any way, shape, or form. Nourishment's important to me. But you can either be nourished cerebrally. You can be nourished just, you know, your stomach's full, you're having a great day, and you feel good. Um, you know, your gut's good. Or you can be nourished because you've been really well taken care of. And that's important to me. And I think, I think you should be able to have that, that experience alone yeah. at a table. And I, don't, and I think that's part of daily life. Um, yeah, I love the solo diner. I, yeah, kudos to people who come in. And I love the solo diner who comes and treats themselves sometimes. Mm. And they order three courses. And, mm. and then I send them another course because I'm like, I love you. I love you. I see I, you. Yeah, I, I see you. I recognize what yeah, you're doing. Yeah, you're like awesome. Awesome. Well, listen, thank you so much. Yeah. If people want to come visit you or check you out online or find anything, where can they go? Porridgeandpuffs.com. And Instagram porch is it spelled out and a and d okay and then on um, on Instagram it's porch and puffs as well it's porch and puffs spelled out a and d everywhere everywhere um, Instagram's the best that's the place that we w- you know you're laugh because we don't update that much either um, I think we don't update a lot as as much as we do but you'll you'll, you'll get the gist yeah Just come, come in, in. Come every in. day is different here every day is different well thank you so much we have another song from the archives and then a live performance here on Snacky Tunes on heritageradionetwork.org Ooh. 
I wanna build a house with you, a house with you, a house with you, a home So we can be alone And I've been running, I've been hiding, I've been falling down and climbing back up Where they think they belong Oh, let's go And I know that you wouldn't try to tell me what you don't. Oh. I want to build a house with you, a house with you. A house with you I want to build a house with you So we can be alone So we can be alone And alone Alone And I've been slipping on my shoes, my tongue is swole, my lips are bruised, and I can't get up the hill. And I've been jumping through some leaves and chopping down some cherry trees, so I, oh, so I can't tell, so I can't tell the truth. To ears and eyes with a killer at your throat. I wanna build a house with you, a house with you, a house with you. I wanna build a house with you so we can be alone, so we can be alone. This episode is brought to you by New York Mutual Trading, the premier Japanese food, alcoholic beverage, and restaurant supply specialist. Mutual Trading is the Japanese food authority, true to the heart in upholding genuine Japanese food traditions, and progressive in exploring new ways to provide innovative restaurant supplies and services. They import, export, distribute, and manufacture the top brands for retailer and food service customers nationwide. Learn more at nymtc.com. All right. All right, here we go. I mean, every time I think that we've had a band that is squeezed in here, <laughs> someone, someone comes someone in and comes steps in. And they fit in. Uh, we are... I mean, let's just go through the gear in the room. We got an amp. We got a ton yeah, of amps outside. Three amps. Three amps. Congas. Congas. Four toms. Four t- two floor toms. Two floor toms. Drum pad. Vibe. 
Vibe. Okay. Own mixer. Some other vibe. A bass. Uh, bass. A, a sound close, guy. Sound guy. I kind of like that you described your um, drum machine as vibes. With his uh, vibes right there. Uh, uh, litany of pedals. Yeah, yeah. We got a lot of pedals in here. I don't see them. Uh, they're, they're there. Um, welcome to Snacky Tunes. Thank you. Uh, our first fall guest. Although it's still kind of summerish outside. Uh, who are you guys? Uh, the name of the band is Sin Kane. Um, Brooklyn band. I'm here with Mikey Freedom Heart ish. The Man of Steel, Aaron. And uh, J Tram. So, why don't you give uh, our listeners a little background on where you guys come from, how you came together? Uh, I started. I started the band a while ago. Oh, introduce yourself too. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, I'm Ahmed Ahmed Gallup, and I I write the music for the group. And I I started the band almost seven years ago. I was living in Ohio. I'm originally from Sudan, and um, uh, I put out two records and kind of uh, got picked up by, by a bunch of different bands to tour so I kind of put the, the group in the back burner but then I moved to New York and I decided I wanted to move on forward with this project so I revamped it I met J Tram when we were playing in Yesair together and th- through you know living in New York I met Mikey Freedom Heart here and he brought along the rest of the crew Ish and Aaron Steele so uh, when you pick up a, a group after, you know, you have two records and you go on toward the bunch of them and come back, you know, what did you learn and bring you into this time around that was different from the first time out? Oh, man. Well, I, I, had, I had like the blessing of touring the world and, and really kind of see a bunch of people do the right thing and a bunch of people do the wrong thing. So, I mean, it, it really puts a lot into perspective. I, I know what I'm getting myself into now when before I was like, 23 year old kid didn't know anything I was just kind of making music all willy nilly and now now it, it, it's giving me a lot of focus you know no no names <coughs> but examples of one person doing the right thing and one person doing the wrong thing you can choose which is first yeah choose whatever you want yeah. uh, well, but no names we don't call people out Mr. X and well yeah I'm, <laughs> I'm, I mean I've I've worked with a lot of really like super super organized people who just uh, are very honest and straight up. I mean, that's one big thing I've I've learned is to be straight up and honest. And if you're not straight up and honest, and it, it creates a lot of anxiety and tension. And that's just, I mean, I guess that's all I can really say. I mean, the right. right the right the right thing is to be honest. The wrong thing is to drink too much. <laughs> <laughs> He's talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> Get us together, Mikey Freedom Watch. God bless. Uh, but so now that you're back in Britain, so how how long has this incarnation been together? Not even a year. I mean, Mikey and I and J Tram, we started playing together in what, like de- December or January? It was January. After the, the only snow that happened last year, so it was either. It's in October January? Or no, it was oh, the no, last weekend in October. Yeah, yeah the so 28th. Yeah, we, we start, it started a little like slow. I was touring with uh, Eleanor Friedberger at the time, and uh, so I didn't, really, I didn't really have as much time as I do now. And then we had another big. Ba- we had a. a a few bass players that we played with, but Ish came through in uh, in May, and we've been playing with him. And then f- just for this, because we want to do something special, we brought Aaron along. But yeah, why don't we why don't we get a tune? You guys need like what ten seconds of noise and then start it. Yeah. How do you guys feel? I think yeah, we're let's see. Yeah. Jack, how do we sound out there? Can I get a thumb? Okay. All right, so let's get uh, just a. Uh, for the room, and then we can start. All right. I'm gonna start over. I fucked up. <laughs> Two. That was a test. Three. Thank you. 
awesome. Uh, you guys are going to do us a big disservice because now everyone's going to want to bring all this gear in because yeah. that sounds so good. It's like, go big or go home. It's, yeah. uh, it's one guy on acoustic guitar. Yeah. He's, re- he's got a lot of effects. That vibes pad is really vibes putting out pad. a lot of vibes. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, really? Oh. My, my vibes pad comes on the next one. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, that, is, that is amazing. That's a really amazing sound. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, we're kind of live mixing here. It sounds awesome, guys. So... Now the band's together, mm-hmm. new record, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. The record's coming out next month, October twenty third on on DFA. Oh, okay. So how did that come about, or what uh, was the recording process? Since you guys have only been together for less than a year. Mm, well, I played drums on it, but these and, and other people came and did yeah. random things. I I recorded it pretty much by myself. Uh, I did like maybe like eighty five percent of the record myself, and then in the in the process of recording. Um, because I played so much with J Tram, I just kind of like had him come in and and uh, redo pretty much all the drums. And Ira from Yes Era came and he recorded a little bit on like he redid some bass. And my friend George Twin Shadow, he ripped a pretty gnarly guitar solo on the record. And oh, you know, we, uh, special guest Shred. So, yeah. Uh, you know, it's That's interesting. Exactly it's interesting what you say that because I was listening to the opening track we played, mm-hmm. and I was like, there's such a Yes Era vibe yeah. to this. Um, but like in, in your own way, but the opening is just like very strong, Jay yep. Sayer esque type yeah. of thing in all the in all the best ways possible. I just tried. I I just kind of figured that's what was gonna happen. So I just <laughs> I was like, which track is it? Jeeper Creeper. I decided Ira Ira plays on that song. Yeah, actually. which is the best way that you can have a Jay Sayer sounding song is by having the dude from Jay Sayer <laughs> play. That kind of yeah. squashes all type of. Uh, yeah, all you know. I just kind of you know call a spade a spade. I guess. No, it's good. And so then how did the DFA thing uh, come around? Um, shout out to John. Yeah, actually, yeah. I think John might be listening. And shout John, out to Chris. John and Chris. Uh, hey, guys. What um, guys? They, uh, were, John was formed. I geeked out on, grew up listening to DFA Records, geeked out on John when he came on the show. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's, a, he's a lord. He's a true lord. Um, <laughs> well, what happened was dance? <laughs> we, well, I, I, released, I released Jeeper Creeper and Running on my own and just kind of the whole Running thing. Uh, kind of, it, it did a lot better than I expected and just randomly in April I got an email from him and he was really interested in the track and he said he wanted to hear some more music so I sent him the record and he really liked it and it just kind of, you know, one thing led to another. It's pretty cool. I mean, is it really just that easy? No, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's really not that easy. But I mean, like, I mean, like, I'm saying we like to, I mean, one of the things we like to show on kids like it, that it is, I mean, you can play it off of like that easy, but it yeah. wasn't that easy. Well, I mean, the thing is the record, the record's been done for almost two years, you right. know, and I've gone through like many, many different ups and downs with it. And it is finally now just starting to like see the light of day. You know, I'm just, I've heard the music so much and mm-hmm. playing it live has really kind of given it new light, but it. It's been done for a long time. I mean, what, you know, for musicians who have been at it, but maybe been toiling a little bit of the unknown and now having, being able to come out on DFA, it's like, can you like share one of like your lowest of lows and like to the point that you actually got through it and got to the other side? Oh, um, how long do we have? Uh, <laughs> we, we got a couple minutes for that answer. <laughs> the lowest of lows, man. Well, um, I, I recorded, oh, man, I, I, uh, when we stopped playing with Yesair, it was kind of J Tram and I. We we had like a year off before we re- we started everything, and I didn't really have anything in the pipeline at all. And the record was was finished, and it seemed like there was some interest, but nothing really happened at all. And I had like a few rehearsals with a bunch of people that didn't really work out, and I didn't really know at all what I was doing. I didn't know like if anything was gonna happen. Ryan here, my my roommate, like, has always been like pretty encouraging and ex- like excited about everything I've been doing. But, uh, so, yeah, I don't I don't know, man. Like, it, it's when you're when you're around to a lot of like really creative and talented people that are succeeding so well, and your project doesn't seem to be succeeding on that level. It just it's a, you sensationalize all your feelings and you think like I had, like you know eighty cents in my bank account and was living in New York and you know was in a really crappy relationship <laughs> with somebody and. You know, so you're saying roommates, all yeah, <laughs> roommates, bandmates, got yeah. you through it. Yeah, yeah. These are like my my. This is like my family. You know, these everyone here is really 
been super encouraging and exciting. I mean, I, th- I mean, I feel like it's important to share those stories mm-hmm. alongside the yeah, I got the record deal that's coming out next month, yeah. just to kind of give a little hope to all the people who are writing good music and toiling alone that like everyone yeah. feels those lows. Like there's not a single person that has not felt that epic, epic, yeah. soul crushing low. I was I I once lost the Yesay or band computer on tour and thought I was gonna get fired and <laughs> it was after you said J Tram's pants on fire. Yeah, <laughs> it's, how did, how did like, you lose it? I that, said J Tram's pants on fire. I lost the band computer well, you, and I was. There's a, long, there's a longer story to that. Which you don't have to yeah, we don't was, have was that part of the uh, drink too much. Advice? That wasn't drink too much. That was. D- the, the, uh, another <laughs> why don't why don't, why don't, why don't, don't, don't and, and we'll leave it at that all right let's, let's, let's don't do drugs yeah, yeah don't do drugs let's rip another song how about that okay what are we gonna song. what are we gonna hear we're gonna hear running okay. the song you played a little bit earlier great Keep on. 
so many vibes. Can we get one of those applause sounds, please, in the room? Just that one. I there it I is. I couldn't hear the vibes. That was the problem. Yeah, the, vi- <laughs> the vibes can be felt all around. Uh, that was amazing. Some New Year's vibes. Um, so you have some upcoming shows, right? You just got done with the residency at Zebulon. Yeah. yeah. How is uh? I love that place. And actually, your vibes fit v- quite well in Zebulon. It was. It was a vibe. It was definitely, that was, I mean, that's definitely what it was. They sell the best. Each time we say that word. Oh, uh, yeah. There's shout one more to, Z. Shout out to Caveman. I, I enjoy their potato yeah. chips they serve at Zebulon's. They have certainly good bag potato chips. Really? Yeah, their yeah. potato chips are great. Are right? Those, at yeah. Least every week. The mozzarella sand, the mozzarella Yeah. Sand, like, they actually have surprisingly food. secretly good bar food. Well, yeah, they do. Really? Yeah. It's a bunch of French guys, right, that own it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're French the French Bohemian. French Bohemian. Yeah, they're... It's definitely... When you say French Bohemian, I just think, like, carafe of wine in hand at all times. Yeah. You know, I think Zebulon's is definitely a place of older Brooklyn. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's, yeah. A, it's a movie thing, jazz, DJ, I mean, cafe. I mean, yeah, older Brooklyn, yeah. Older Brooklyn, I mean, we, like, five, ten years ago. Yeah. We live... Bef- <laughs> not older, older, like, shootout, druggy Brooklyn. No. Yeah. We, I mean, we live right down the street from there, and it's Don't always blow. a scene. Don't blow up our spot. I mean, our so, spot... Our spot's getting blown up by a wrecking ball in three months anyway, yeah. so... <laughs> that's, that's the new Brooklyn. Yeah, that's yeah. the new that's Brooklyn. The, that's, that new, that's that new, new I've been new, new. about. So uh, where are you, uh, where are you coming? You're playing a couple shows in September, right? Yeah, we're playing with... We're playing Music Hall of Williamsburg on, on Sunday the 23rd with Lee Scratch Perry, which we're all really... No big, no big deal. No, no, no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> we're playing at Death by Audio on the 27th with Sun Ra, and we're playing at DeKalb Market. Uh, they're having a big blowout party at the end of the month on the 30th. So Who's playing the DeKalb Market Party? Man, you know, I, I don't know. Okay, that's, that's a good uh, place. Yeah, that place is. It's like this. Place. It's also Shipp- shipping containers. It's all shipping. Yeah. Have you been out there? Yeah, we go. I mean, Mike, Mikey lives right next to it, so we always grab coffee and. There's, there's this really awesome place that makes these like chicken biscuit, chicken biscuit yeah. sandwiches. Yeah. Are just so Can you please el- please elaborate? Sandwiches. Yeah. Please elaborate. Like, is it the biscuit and the chicken in there? Or, like, what makes it so? Chicken's biscuit, coleslaw. The buttermilk yeah. biscuit with chicken gravy biscuit, and coleslaw. fried chicken in the middle. It's mm-hmm. a coleslaw. You guys cook a lot. You guys, you guys got your places to eat on the road. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot. Uh, Bills in, uh, in Brighton, in yeah. Brighton, England That's is the only spot. one of the Bills. Yo, shout Bills. out to Sheets. Big up, the- <laughs> <laughs> Big up the Bills. Yeah, what's Bills? Bills is like a, it's like a really awesome like market, like a farm market place it's like or everything is organic and everything is really, always changing big lofty yeah. spot you know uh, they, mm. they you can go in there you you go in there it kind of looks like um just like a, a mark uh, like a a farmer's market um but they with the yeah, with a lot of table everything is just really fresh and delicious I and mean, when you go on tour it's that's the that's the one thing that kind of blows your mind because you're eating like Mustard packets and Coors Light <laughs> all day. Yeah, that, oh, it's a shot of uh, mustard right. in the Coors Light, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like a lime mm-hmm. with a ketchup chaser. Awesome. Really uh, so let's get all the nuts and bolts. Where can people find you? Where can people get your music? Website, Friendster, uh, lipstick <laughs> and cigarettes <laughs> profile. You always make Friendster. that joke, and it always works. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new, hey, it's a new, it's a new band every week, and they haven't heard the other shows. <laughs> yes. Um, Check out sim- our podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> Simcane.com. S I N yeah. S I N K A N E. Uh you know, Sincane Twitter, Sincane Ra on Facebook. Um what else? Well and then uh DFA, DFA records, yeah. When is it when's the release date? October twenty third. Can you pre order? Man, this should be coming up pretty soon. Chris, that's a good question. Yeah. I know he's listening. Well how about we say about how about we say that if uh the email Chris will put him on the pre pre order list. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he'll, then he'll uh, really enjoy that too. Release party? Dance party? October 23rd, uh, we're playing a show at the Brooklyn Bowl. Oh, perfect. So. Fried chicken? Oh, yeah. um, oh, so uh, much fried chicken. Yeah. Hey, here, here's, here's my question to you. What is your process of eating when you play Brooklyn Bowl? Are you a before show eater or do you do well, you got to wait till after? after. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I really like their fried chicken and I got to do that afterwards or else. You're clearly divided I, on this. I'm kind of <laughs> like a wingman during the set type of thing. Just... You know, in between. Yeah, I like. I, I if I greasy fingers. Yeah, I get, I get a dozen. I get you know six on table one, six, six on table two. But yeah, that's it's so tempting because you're there for so long and you know you want to dig in. But that's yeah. I mean, it is. That's the reward. It is a very good 
place to eat. Three more songs till chicken wings. Yeah. Two more songs till chicken wings. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much where I'm <laughs> at. One more song to boozy milkshake, right? I can uh, only... I, yeah. Well, I, can, I can't do that one. That's the ender. If that's I, it? If I have that, then it's, it's, that's, it's the... That's on the way out. Margarita in one hand, boozy uh, milkshake anyway. All right, one more song, <laughs> yeah. then we're out. Yeah, then we're, then, out. then we're off to Jersey. Off to Jersey to the to aunt's house for Rosh Hashanah. Thank you guys for all coming in here. Awesome. This all was right. totally worth all the effort. Thanks uh, for wh- having us. Yeah, what's the last song called? It's called Young Trouble. This is a new joint. Oh, and uh, hold on, sorry. One big shout out. Tomorrow night up at Dinosaur Barbecue, Marcus Samerson and a whole bunch of Harlem chefs are doing an incredible, incredible, incredible food event. Check it out. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. All right. All right. This program is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. 
For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.